Welcome into another episode of Debate Night, everybody. We've got a little bit of a live setup today because Brody is here. Brody is sitting. The hat is popping. Yeah. Electric blue. I'm liking this hat a lot. Um, yeah, we've got uh, the three of us here. Obviously, I'm your host as always, but then Dustin is joining us today as well. Dressed for the occasion. Big day for Dustin. He finally got the win he always wanted. Isn't that right? Hound dog boom, baby. Did you say hound dog? Hound dog boom. I don't know. The hey, if you know, you know. If you know, you know. Well, that's okay. I don't All know right. anything that has to do with Alabama. If you know, you other know. Other than their maybe. football team stinks. To. Wait, what is, what's, with the, what's with the visor situation? He's not wearing a or visor. Like, not visor, but uh, like, it's like a visor sunglasses. It's like it's a like sunglasses. It's the only sunglasses I have. Sunglasses. Like, I, I don't. You know, I'm working with limited equipment over here to try to make this happen. So I did what I could. All right. Some people will appreciate it. Some people won't. It's okay. Are you are you an Alabama fan or are you a Matty no, O fan? I'm a Matty O fan. Okay. He's yeah. a Matty O fan. Number one. I would mm, could argue. Could be. Are number you the one. number one Matty O fan? Would you self proclaim that? I'm sure like his family or his fiance would probably be his number one wow, fan. Wow, so you're like that level. Could you, yeah. So I don't, like how I don't many want to intrude upon that. What's like your favorite Matty O fun fact? Favorite Matty O fun fact. That was you, gotta, you, you just got to know if you're a real fan. The A Rod jersey, right. man. That's uh, for some reason people misquote that as being a Derek Jeter jersey. It was an A Rod jersey. 2005 Worlds. Worlds. 2005. 2005. Worlds. Yeah. <sighs> Sorry, uh, I'm not very educated with that. All good, man. Um, all right. Well, we're gonna hop right into it. We've got some interesting subjects today. One that just arose yesterday that I think is gonna be very interesting to talk about. Uh, First thing we're going to talk about has to do with the MVP Open. We're going to go over a few subjects from that event. Obviously, one of the biggest and most fun tournaments of the year to consume. One thing that happened that I think slipped under the radar a little bit, maybe not everybody was aware of, but there was a wind delay during the tournament and some complaints arose. Uh, I actually just saw a video of the said wind. Brody showed me uh, yesterday him putting in it, and I was like, holy cow, that was insane. But basically, there was a wind delay issued. Uh, I believe it was right. It was before lead card teed off. It was five, like five or four minutes before. Right before they teed off, uh, and there was question as to was there favoritism shown to lead card? Why did they not have to play in the wind? Why did they? Get, why wasn't it called sooner? So my question here is: Was the wind delay issue during the MVP Open fair to all competitors? Do they need a better system for this? What do we think about it, Brody? Short answer: It wasn't fair. Obviously, because some people some people had to play in terrible wind conditions the entire round, and some people were able to play um, the back nine with very limited wind. I remember seeing a clip from Kevin Jones' uh, ace run that he had on fourteen, where it like skipped off the basket. The flag wasn't moving at all, and I think he even said, I think he even I overheard him say he threw a mid on that hole. When we got to that hole. It was like a 30 mile an hour with Gus higher right to left. So one of us like almost went into the lake on the left. Uh, another person soared it super high. I went super high left and then someone threw it like way out and it didn't come back. So like that hole was like nearly impossible. So if we're talking simply just on fairness, no. But then at the same point, you're never going to be able to make everything fair. There's going to be some people that have to play in the, the rain. It, you know, There's going to be some people that have to um, play in the dark. That's the other thing that's really interesting is what, I, what I've seen is it just seems like a lot of tour players, and myself, has, I, I've been included in this as well, is when something negatively impacts you, you bring it up. But when something negatively impacts someone else, you don't really make a big stink about it. And for the example, perfectly, the perfect example of that is Idlewild. Those guys that had to play those last couple holes in the dark, super not, not fair at all. Yeah. But not that many people were bringing that up. So a lot of times we just look at, oh, Lee Card gets this, this, and this, when I think in fairness, it, it kind of balances itself out. Um, my big thing with the wind thing that I don't understand is we waited about 90 minutes or so to restart. And then when they said we're restarting, it was just as windy as when we stopped. Mm. So that's where I don't really understand what happened and why it ended up being that way. Um, but it is what it is. Okay. Hunter, what did you think about the wind delay? Do you think it was fair? Do they need to change the ruling on that? Well, 
uh, I mean, to straight answer the question, was it fair? No. Um, but I think Brody brought up a good point, which is weather, especially in disc golf, is never going to be fair. There's no way with players teeing off morning all the way through the afternoon that everyone's going to play in the exact same conditions and get the course. Because even, forget weather, let's just say that there's dew on the ground in the morning. That's a different aspect. Mm-hmm. Let's say even greens are going to be trampled more. So skips might be more prevalent in the afternoon and stuff like that. There's a lot of things in disc golf that just by nature aren't going to be fair. What this is, though, is we need to control the things we can control and things you can't control, you can't. The when this weather delay happened is what we can control. So in my opinion, I think what's the least fair of this is that it was a few minutes before lead card tees off, a little bit of a weird timing. I'm not going to say it was intentional that way, but you can point fingers. It, it is a weird time to randomly decide now that it's too windy, especially to just send them back out in the same wind when players have been playing in that all day. That's an easy one to point fingers at. Um, so I think f- there needs to be set rules that's just followed. So like if we're going with wind delays in disc golf, then it needs to be when wind is consistently at X miles per hour, that causes a wind delay. We have it for lightning. It's pretty clear line of lightning. Let's do it for wind. Um, same thing with darkness level. There should be some type of way of maybe it's visibility. Maybe it's something cause like wooded courses are slightly different than open courses when it comes to darkness. I don't know exactly how to measure that. Maybe you get a refractometer out there something, whoa, but when we whoa, go, whoa. um, yeah, when we go darkness level, it's the same thing, bro. said, even if it only affects four people, those four people, we should be able to control. What we can control. And when you get them off the course in relation to darkness, we can control that. Um, so I think we should, try to just have strict, not strict rules, but a clear defined line. So then it is fair to everyone. Cause you can't yeah. say, well, I was playing in 40 mile an hour winds and then lead car tees off. It's 42 and they didn't tee off because that it's like, well, no, the, you knew going into it. If it hits 39 miles an hour consistent or whatever, we decide consistent winds, or if we want to go gust level, then you know, we're getting a delay until it comes back to that time frame. I think that'd be the most fair. All right. Dustin, do you agree? Do you think we need wind delays at all? What are your thoughts? I think it depends on the, the course, right? Because, I mean, if you're wide out in the open, then wind is not necessarily as much of a safety issue as it's going to be in a situation like this one where you're playing in the woods. And from what I understand from things that I had read and seen, and again, I wasn't there, so I, I can't know the full picture, but supposedly there were limbs actually falling on spectators, and that is kind of what actually prompted them to go ahead and call the delay it wasn't the wind itself it was the fact that it was causing a safety issue with debris and branches falling and and things of that nature Uh, and i think that that is ultimately why they decided to do this and i think it's just really murky waters in this particular situation because i feel like from an outside presence from what i was seeing and reading from like players on the ground and staff on the ground it there was like so many different perspectives being taken like you had some people saying that they experienced heavy winds in their, during their round and it wasn't delayed when they were out there even though they were experiencing the same winds that were happening when it got delayed you had people out there who felt that it wasn't really that windy when it got delayed um you had people coming out saying that they felt like the wind was still pretty heavy even after the delay um and, and so that brings into question the timing of when they called it and when they decided to lift it um i don't know if it was a situation where they just felt like this isn't going to get any better and we can't sit here and let this round get into the darkness and have to delay until the next day or whatever the case may be so i I wonder if that factored in um and at the end of the day you know it may not be fair but if there is indeed a safety issue being caused in a situation like this where wind is causing like debris and branches falling and things of that nature then you you have to call i think that type of situation and none of us really here are, are experts on on when to make those calls but obviously, I think all you can do is learn from this, set up processes for the future. Like, you know, Hunter was saying, you know, maybe we eventually find a gust limit or a sustained wind limit that we feel is going to cause safety issues. And then from there, we start making delays. And this is just like one of those, like, in, in, in the insurance world, they call it like an act of God, right? Where you have no control mm-hmm. over it, like whether it be wind, rain trees falling whatever the case may be and so in those situations all you can do is just delay for safety and yeah that is going to mean that some players maybe get to play in different conditions than others and so it's not totally fair but that's going to be the case in so many scenarios with weather you know whether it be wind whether it be rain whether it be based on your tea time you know the conditions in the course versus morning versus afternoon like these things are always going to happen and you can't control it um all we can do is maybe kind of see what happened and try to improve processes for the future yeah, the wind delay thing is very interesting with disc golf because, like you mentioned, safety, I think I agree. 
Uh, I heard there was limbs falling, almost hitting players, spectators. I well, think. I have additional point. Yeah. If I well, just to add, so I talked to the person that is in charge of calling it when it comes to okay. you know weather and stuff, and I I had messaged him because I, I was curious because we had a, a limb that was you know 15 feet, 10 feet, something like that, fall from 30 or 40 feet from us when we were on hole six, mm -hmm. and so I texted him after the delay saying hey if i would have texted you saying hey a, a limb just fell would you have called Probably. it and he he actually surprisingly said no he oh. said we would have walked out we would have assessed the situation and seen what was going on and then make made a call from there so it's not because i think some people got uh they heard that too hole 14 was the hole that uh, a limb fell close to spectators and i think people were like oh if limbs are falling they're going to call it they're not um, because a limb fell at Ledgestone when we were playing out there, they didn't call it. I think it's a case by case basis. And also the weird thing with the wind thing of where you're saying, Hey, if we get gusts over 40, we're calling it. Well, if we're gusts at, at f over 40 at Northwood, that might be different than at Maple Hill where the trees are much smaller. Um, it could be different too. If it rained the night before and there's, you know, the, the leaves and everything are heavier. So the branches are heavier, more likely to fall. There's a lot of scenarios the person that has to make that call probably has the suckiest job in the world because everyone's going to second guess them. Yeah. They want disc golf to happen. So as much as we want to be like, oh, they're protecting Lee Card, oh, they're doing this, I think at the end of the day, it just ended up being really bad timing yeah. and how it all looked out. Um, it's a sucky situation. And unfortunately, I don't think they're ever going to be able to make a, say, a statement where it's like, hey, if it's at a certain – uh, miles per hour, we have to call it because every scenario is going to be different. Right. And, and I think that I just don't believe in the conspiracy. You know, like I, I do think that if this exact situation would have happened an hour earlier in the day, they would have probably made the same call. Like, I don't think that this is a lead card, chase card, broadcast thing. I think this is very much of in the heat of the moment, what's happening this is what we think is the best decision for this moment. So like, it's also I, terrible yeah. for the sure. like disc golf network. It's terrible. Like yeah. your well, event's you to, about to start and then yeah, you're like, exactly. psych, like that's, they you don't do want have that to factor happen. lead card, not necessarily the conspiracy side, but you're about to have the most spectators on the course at once. Yeah. You mm -hmm. have to factor that it's, safety it's, concerns go uh, get yeah. elevated. Sure. It's, closer not, to lead it's, card. it's a, it's a very much like heated situation when you're the guy who has to call it and you see limbs falling, potentially an injury. Like it's no, a scary I've situation. Been, I've been a tournament director who has to make weather calls. It sucks every time it's because I've made a weather call where within the PDGA, the storm's coming, I see lightning, and the storm hasn't hit yet, and it's a weird line of like, well, if I wait for the storm to get any closer, it could get bad quick, but the storm could also miss us. Right. I always erred on, we're going on the side of caution. Nobody's getting hit by lightning. Who's going to be upset if, I, if you come to me and you're pissed off, and I'm like, I'm just trying to make sure no one got hurt. Right. I have to call people in from a half a mile away, yep. and they got to walk. And there's been times where I called it. Like I said, hey, we're going to blew the horn. People came in, and the storm went by, and it never rained there. And we sent people back out. And I had a few people come up and upset, and I was like, my other option was see if the storm hit us, and then once it hit us, call. And now I have a 60-year-old man on hole 10, yeah. and he's got to walk two miles back right. in a, a storm. Hopefully now, I think people lightning. grossly underestimate how far lightning can travel from a storm to where you are. They like, never and underestimate a, lightning. Yeah. That's exactly. The line. That's the bottom line. Um, two <laughs> points to Trevor. Uh, yeah, two points to me. Um, yeah, weather delays never a perfect system. Interesting to see uh, how they'll proceed with those in the future. I don't think it was a huge deal. Um, now the main storyline from the MVP Open, uh, at least in the MPO division, was Matty O getting the win. This was in his long career, his first. Uh, elite series or major win that includes national tours. Uh, they wrote that into that statistic. So a lot of people were throwing this around, but I want to ask everybody, was Matty O the best player to never won an elite series or major win? This is something that gets, it gets thrown about, around a lot in, uh, in golf and professional golf. Like who are the best players to have never won? Um, so my question is, was Matty O that player? And if so, who is it now? Who is, who are we passing the torch to? So to speak, Hunter, what do you think? It's a very weird question because like, in order to fit that bill, the person who holds that stance is typically someone who has been playing for a long time and just hasn't done it, right? Yeah. Like, it, it's normally not an up-and-comer. Um, but I'm going to say no. I'm going to say he, he's, he wasn't, and I think he still obviously currently isn't because now he has a win. Because I think the best, we got to just look at the best disc golfer, the player with the most talent, who hasn't done it yet, 
And I think that brings in a bunch of young talent who I would argue is better than Matt Eo. The one I'm going to go with is Anthony Barella because um, I think his ceiling's higher. And sure, he's not as consistent, but I think that comes with his age. So, Because realistically, you got to think. Matt Eo, I think, had a similar career to Nate Sexton so far, right? But the difference is Nate Sexton, when it came down, knew how to win, and he did win multiple times. Matt Eo, 7,000-some days, no win. So you're in that scenario over and over. He's in a position to win over and over, and he didn't. Is that greatness? That's a question I would like to ask. Oh, Dustin, how do you respond? So clearly I have no bias at all in this question whatsoever. Um, I'm sure you guys can tell by my physical appearance that there's you know nothing here, completely objective. But I do believe without a doubt that at – the time before the MVP open started that Matteo was the best player to have never done it. And the reason for that is first off longevity. He has been played at the highest level of the sport since, you know, 2003, he came second place at worlds in 2005. And he's been very competitive at that stage. Even when he wasn't fully touring, he was always a contender in those world championships. Not only that, but across his career, he attended 41 majors and he had a top 10 finish rate of 46% and he cashed at 90% of them. So the dude was always in the mix in the biggest tournaments throughout his 20 year career. Um, you know, I think there was what 18 years that separated his first podium finish from worlds to the two that he just got in a row. He went back to back, obviously between uh, worlds and Emporia and worlds that we just had this year, obviously uh, also in recent years when he's been fully on tour, he has been very consistently in or near the top 10 ranking wise. Uh, and you know, he had that whole stat that they put on the broadcast where he had 12 podiums and 60 top tens without the win, which was by a huge margin more than anyone else really on tour that, you know, had that type of longevity. So I do think this is a guy who was clearly very talented, had a lot of skills, was always in the mix, always one of those guys that was called a great golfer, but just didn't have the win. And so I do think he was, you know, that guy now. I think some honorable mentions would have been some people like a, like a James Proctor or a Joel Freeman or, or some of these other guys who have been on tour for, you know, a decent amount of time, but not nearly as long as Matteo that haven't had their win yet. And I will agree with uh, Hunter now, though. I do think that right now, the person that you have to pick as, you know, the best to have, who have not done it yet is going to be AB. Uh, you know, AB has been touring since I think around 2015, 2017, not full time, but like he's played some tour events for a decent amount of time. He's got, Clearly tons of talent. He's been ranked uh, in or near the top 10 for a, a couple of years now and currently still sits in that position. He had the three podium finishes this year, including Worlds. We know what happened at European Open, how close he was to maybe doing that. Uh, you know, he has a, a really great finish rate, and so I would definitely put him up there. Hey, B, man, still stings, but music to my ears. He's, he's the new GOAT. Um, you heard it here first. Brody, what do you think? Yeah, the Matty O one's so interesting because I wonder how much – he played into that himself of where, you know, you start having a bunch of people around you telling you the greatest that have, you know, that's never won. Is that something that you just start believing yourself? Like, Oh yeah, I, I can't win, but I am really good at disc golf. <laughs> um, Maybe. I mean, he has, I have talked to him and he has mentioned that like he's made comments, not in like a funny way, but, He's made like serious comments about like, yeah, I'm really good at getting top 10. Like I know how to play to get top 10. Um, and something that I thought was really fascinating. I did not know this. The first time he played Maple Hill, he should have won. 2010? Yeah, 2010. He, he lost it on the final hole. Yep. That's wild. So like, I mean, he was in the mix for a lot of tournaments, but it's crazy that like he literally – could have this narrative could have never existed if he would have just played the final hole better at that same tournament um i think i would say i think the name because you mentioned a lot of good ones dustin with proctor and freeman and then obviously ab with you know i think what he's done on the majors has elevated his name a lot this season but maybe someone that's a little bit under the radar, just mainly because you guys didn't bring him up, is Aaron Gossage. Um, he, I mean, he sneaky got second place at MVP. Um, obviously, the battle he had with Paul at Worlds. And then he's had a couple other tournaments where, like, OTB, that putt doesn't, you know, spit out on hole 16. He probably wins that. Um, he had a good chance at, uh, or sorry, I'm talking about Portland, Portland, the putt doesn't spit out. He probably has a good chance of winning that OTB. He was kind of in a really good spot to win 
there's been a lot of tournaments where he's kind of like just sneaky in spots mm-hmm. to potentially Worlds, win. Like last year. Yeah, that was what I'm saying. Oh, the, I zoned out. That was that was the the obvious one. But there's other you can tournaments. Take a point away. I'm gonna take away a point for that. That's fair. There's other tournaments <laughs> that he's been kind of sneaky in, and uh, the only thing I would say that's obviously different with him with Joel and Proctor is like he's more of the AB of where they haven't had that many opportunities. Right. Proctor but, though, not to jump into your mid-year point, but Proctor just started touring. Yeah, well, full touring. He he's. I would say he's a little ahead. He's not Joel Freeman, but he's still a little ahead of A. B. and Gossage. If you look at the number of events, yes, because he still would play in the five or six events um, on the West Coast and majors and all that stuff. Right. But um, yeah, I would also, say those are the those are the ones. I would add a little extra context on the Matty O side, by the way, is that, um, and this is probably the case for a lot of players, not just him, but I know for a fact that he was a type of guy early in his career where he needed the cash to stay on tour and so i think the, the killer instinct to go for the win a lot of the times wasn't there because it was like well i could play safe and make sure that i get a good cash out here or Certainly i could push for the factor. win and risk it all and i get nothing um Certainly now that factor. he's in a situation where he has a you know a more comfortable guaranteed income it's a little bit easier to go for some of the more aggressive plays and try to make a win happen. So I think that goes into it too. But again, that's not just Matty. I think a lot of people fell into that category for we, a while. We've, yeah, we've seen it multiple times. I mean, a recent example was uh, Bradley Williams at that silver in, at North Cove. Literally, yep. he said he was like needed the needed the cash, like needed the, the money. The interesting Matty O question is, and it's not really that interesting. But like, let's say this is his only win. Mm-hmm. Is it? I don't know exactly how to ask the questions going on in my head, but like, if you're constantly <laughs> being told and you're constantly telling yourself, "I'm the greatest player to have never won," mm-hmm. now you've won. Yeah, that part's gone. Yeah, yeah. What are you now? A great just, player. Just a good disc golfer. Yeah. That is. Wait, the wait a sport, second. Right? Wait a second. It's a question. Is I, it I a don't le- know the question? Wait I'm a asking, second. But is, it's just like is a, it a legacy downgrade? Mem- like. Not like statistics, not, be, not statistics wise. Forgotten. Yeah, not statistic wise, but saying, remembering wise. Now, because because now, yeah, before he was the top of the conversation. The greatest he's the best to have never, never won. Now, now he's just it. a guy who has one win. That's how I'm trying to work. Wait a second. You know what I'm saying? Like if who's, he doesn't win, who's more talked about? Like Dan Marino or Trent Dilfer? I don't know who Trent Dilfer is. Exactly. Who won a Super Bowl? Exactly. You know who? I didn't? know Dan Marino is. Dan Marino. It might have been. Trevor put a tweet out. This that was might a be the worst joke. thing for you, Dustin. <laughs> tweet. Trevor put a tweet out as a funny joke that might have had some truth behind it. <laughs> that could have been the worst thing for Matteo's brand because before he would he could have retired. I wouldn't say for his current brand. No, but, but long term. Ten years from now, he could yeah, have been the, the greatest the day, to have really retired. Cares. He wants to win. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you never lane up to not win. I'm just saying, outside perspective. <laughs> outside perspective. Lays up to not win. You have to lay up four times to not win. So just, yeah, just something to think about. One. Just something to, to weigh on your mind. Thing, yeah. Though, of like, no, like I, a genuine, genuine it's more thought. Just a I'm not funny, being funny. A funny question, like yeah. ten years from like, now. Like ten years from now, I is think, Matteo not remembered because he's not the greatest to have never done it anymore? I th- well, ge- see, I'm genuinely is- asking. I'm not trying to be funny. <laughs> well, my I, genuine, no, I, hold on. So my genuine answer to that would be is I think Matty O's remember more for his personality more than anything. And I think that that's going to transcend no matter what he does on the so court. So you think he's like, John the Daly type guy? That he is. No, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know John Daly, so I'm not going to try to make that comparison at all. But what I'm just saying is, is that like, really people know Matty O because of right? the attitude that he brings no. to the course and the personality that he yes. shows on yes. the camera. And I think that that is going to be how he's remembered more than anything else. And the oh. fact that he was so good for so long, the longevity will always well, be there. We'll all get who's, back on the call in ten years and we'll discuss it. Last question then: Who oh, is on. like who's the Matty O now that hasn't? Because you're saying he's more about his personality, and not the fact that he almost has won so many times. Who who would you comp that with with someone else on tour that's known for their personality but not known for big winning? germ? It's a good Did one. Big germ win a major. He won a yeah, USCGC, a but it was kind of like an asterisk one. But Oof. still. Oof. Well, I'm saying he's known more time, for his personality than for winning. If I mean, you, Calvin was known modern... for that, too, before he won. He was always consistently uh-huh. close to winning, but he had, like, a massive personality. His personality. I'm, I'm saying, <laughs> yeah, no, no, whatever. No, no. People love Calvin. My, my own content. My, Are you curious? Uh, my thing is, is, is like, um, is like okay. Big Germ's not – well, if you ask a – It's uh, not so, a good question. If you ask Never someone mind. who just got into disc golf, they probably wouldn't know Big Germ has a major win, but they would know who Big Germ is. True. All right. Okay. All right. That's let's move on. One other sneaky name I thought of who made a case, at least at the beginning of the season, Ezra Aderhold. 
mm-hmm. starting to make a case as one of those guys hasn't won yet, but a sneaky good season. Couple events, yep. Um, all right, we're gonna move on to kind of some FPO talk from MVP Open. Um, there was a little bit of debate on this I was noticing. So if you weren't following, Kristen Tatar had a lead going into the final stretch, uh, being chased by Owen Scoggins and Haley King. A uh, few mistakes made by Kristen Tatar, but also some good play by Haley King on the final stretch. Some people were saying, oh, Kristen gave it away. Some people were saying, no, Haley King, you know, clutched up and took it. So which statement is more true? Kristen gave away the MVP Open or Haley King took the MVP Open from Kristen? Dustin. Gotcha. So obviously it's a combo of both, but you said what is most true. Most and so true. what is most true for me is that Haley King took the win. And the way I'm going to go about this is just looking at the final round kind of as a whole and just kind of seeing how it played out. So first of all, the tar puts together an incredible front, front nine um, outside of the final hole, the front nine hole. nine. I think she took a double or something like that, but she was on a hot streak to kick off, you know, the, the final round. Whereas Haley King, on the other hand, slips behind a little bit more, had a bit of a slower start, wasn't making any mistakes, wasn't really scoring. And so she was finding herself in a situation where she would have to make the comeback story, so to speak, right? That pressure's there now. So now I will admit it's true that Tatar made some mistakes down the stretch. She had an awful approach on hole 16. I don't know what the heck happened there. She just threw it into the bushes in front of her and got like, no progress towards the basket. That obviously led to, you know, losing a stroke there. And then obviously there's the whole three-putt situation on hole 17 where she kind of airballed it uh, and, and struggled to get off that green. However... And then this is where the separation comes to me about whether or not Haley took it or whether or not Christian Tatar threw it away. Is going into hole 18, Tatar was very much still in contention to win. She was only a stroke behind, right? On hole 18, she was also first to act on the approach, which is like the most critical shot on hole 18. I mean, obviously, you got to get clean off the team, put yourself in position, but that approach is so tricky, and so many people struggle to get it on the green to have a chance to get the birdie. Well, Tatar was able to make that happen, and she was first to act, remember, to do it. So now all the pressure's on King. She has the one-stroke lead. All she has to do is make this approach shot happen, tap in, and then she wins. Otherwise, if she doesn't make it happen, there's potential for playoff, obviously, if she winds up, like, parring the hole. Or worse, you know, bogey's in play, uh, and it becomes a real problem at that point. So uh, a situation where I think King was the one that went on a tear down the stretch in the meantime. She went four down through seven holes. She made an incredible putt on hole 14. That 60-footer, or, or 15 rather, was was insane that, that she hit. That 60-footer was like a massive stroke that she got. But that was an incredible individual effort, not something that Tatar did to throw away. It's something that she earned on her own. And then, yeah, when you look at the back-to-back birdies of 17 and 18 from King, the fact that she was last to act on 18's approach and she came in the clutch with the pressure on, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that King took the win. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough, Brody. Do you agree? Well, I would I would say this. I would say we have seen Kristen make mistakes in the final round and and still win because no one was really close enough at that point, so it didn't matter. Yeah, Haley did do everything that she needed to to put herself in the position to win. Mm-hmm. However, like Dustin said, Kristen was eighty feet away from the basket, threw it into bushes. I mean, I don't know what happened there. That she should be getting up and down from there like 99% of the time. And then, so that's one stroke. And then um, the next hole, hole 17, she lays up that putt, doesn't even run it, lays up, taps in. That's another stroke. Now she goes to hole 18 with a stroke lead versus uh, one stroke behind. At that point, it doesn't matter what Haley does, and she wins. So, in my, the way I'm viewing it is again, you kind of, because, again, when you look at these things of, like, who won and who didn't, you kind of have to go down to the very last holes because you almost have to throw everything away at the beginning. And so if I'm looking just at hole 16, 17, and 18, and that's what I'm looking at, Haley did play well because I would agree um, hole 18, Haley was like, I'm either winning this or losing this because it's, there is no par. Par is out of the question. If you go for the green, par is out of the question. You're either getting a bogey or a birdie. So yeah. she was like, I'm either going to win – or I'm going to lose. Playoff was not going to happen. And so I do give her credit for uh, clutching up and throwing that shot. Um, But again, I don't think that shot matters if Kristen doesn't make two massive mistakes by throwing into bushes, which, again, it wasn't even like there was a tight gap. She could have just done a patent pending, like, big turnover shot and then, you know, just lay up the putt on 17. Yeah. So Brody thinks the mistake's outshined Correct. the Haley play. Uh, so split so far, Hunter, what do you think? 
I'm bringing in a third player of own Scoggins through this away on hole 11. Uh, no. Um, I'm actually, so here's the thing is Haley King and Haley King, Kristen, I'm not a huge fan of this question simply because I think they're both equally true because what happened is one player messed up. The other player took advantage. One player wanted as much as the other lost, but I have to gun to my head. I have to pick one. I agree with Brody's statement. You got to throw out the beginning of the round because now we're in crunch time. And here's the facts of the matter. When we're in crunch time, Haley King birdies three of the last four holes. She did all she could do. And Chris and Tatar still should have won that tournament. Yeah. So, therefore, the crucial one to me, 16 is what it is. How do you throw in the bushes in front of you? I don't know. I wasn't at that lie. I've made dumb mistakes. I can't really say anything. 17, you're Chris and Tatar. You make that putt. Again, it doesn't matter what Haley King has done, the first putt. But instead, she airballed it. She three-putted on that hole. And we're ignoring 16. So, to me, Haley King did all she could do. Everything that she could do, she played as good as possible. Haley King did everything she needed to do to win that event. Haley King took that event. But Kristen still gave it to her because Kristen had – if Kristen didn't make the mistakes, it wouldn't have mattered what Haley King did down the stretch. Kristen would have still won. So uh, going last on that sucks because both people had opposing takes. I just had to agree with someone. <laughs> but own Scoggins hole 11. That's an interesting spin to put yeah. in there. you got to think through Someone's that because she did tie she second lost, and she, she took a seven. Strokes. Yeah, she lost three strokes. Uh, yeah, it's a tough one. I, I, it's hard to, like you said, Kristen, those mistakes are really bad, but I will say the shot on 18 from Haley after watching two people put it under the basket for birdie was very, very nice. I did not know if she was going to lay up or not. I I thought when she picked that putter out of her bag and I was like, don't do it. Don't do, you better go for that green. (laughs) I wanted to, well, she was so close that it was less than 200 feet. So I knew she, like a putter wasn't going to be the deciding factor of a layup or not. Cause she was going to know it was just the way the commentator started kind of inkling, which was was honestly good. They kind of, they kind of like gave a little intrigue, like, Oh, maybe she will lay up. And your first problem, I thought listening to commentary. Yeah. I I think they thought, I think they thought the putter meant that she was laying up. And I think they were just kind of like suspecting that there could be a possibility and it's not like crazier things haven't happened. No. Yeah. Like it would I, not have shocked me in the yeah. slightest. No, I know. I'm just saying, I think <laughs> well, the, the vibe I got was the, because it wasn't a fairway driver, they thought she was laying up. When and I was MVP, like, she's the close playoff goes to back it. to 18, right? You restart yeah. on 18. So if I'm if I'm in that situation, you ever, if it. I ever just find myself in that situation, mm-hmm. you go for it because you're, having to you're gonna have to replay game. the same hole. It's, it's not like I like my chances on hole one more. No. Yeah. You're going back the, to 18. The thought there is am I in a good spot? Because if you're not in a good spot, then it's like let's replay the hole and maybe try. She was in the perfect the spot. spot. You're yeah, not going to yeah. get in a better spot than that, so it's like sure. might as well send it. Yeah. Um, all right, we're going to move on to our last subject here before a rapid fire round. This is a recent one, just popped up yesterday. Got a pretty sad announcement, which was that the IDGC, which is the host of Champions Cup, that is where WR Jackson is, as well as a couple other really nice courses, has been attacked by beetles. Mm. Interesting uh, disc golf news. But what was the? Do you remember the species? I did not have that on my Southern bingo card. Pine. Southern, Southern pine, pine yeah. beetles. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah they, they. We've seen this happen at courses in our area where basically these beetles Those are will, ash tree beetles. Yeah, they'll happen. eat trees yeah. and then they become a hazard where they have to clear them out. So as far as we know, W R Jackson is going to have to be stripped of trees, redesigned. It's it's very sad. But then the more puzzling decision was that the P D J just immediately made that. Well, at least immediately as far as these announcements followed each other in the same day. Um, they decided we are going to keep it the Champions Cup here, and because we're doing that, it is getting moved to the end of October. It's actually going to stretch into the beginning of November. The tour would uh, have a major going into November. So what are your thoughts on the recent announcement with W.R. Jackson and the rescheduling of Champions Cup? Is it a good plan? What are the flaws? What do we think about it? Brody. A couple things. First, we got to figure out what the number one predator of the southern pine beetle is let because that thing needs to just yeah if you're a disc golf course let that thing loose yeah second i don't trust a single thing the pdj ever says no trust they have gone back on so many things and i think this is another one where they they I, who are they talking to i don't know who <laughs> they are talking to <laughs> they just I, whoever is on their board of like hey i think this is a good idea I don't think they have any sort of grasp on disc golf, uh, the pro tour, on the players, on anything. Because first off, the media, the media crew right now, they are done. 
they are ready for the season to be over. I mean, it is a long season, and they've been grinding the whole time. They're probably not ecstatic with seeing, like, wait, next year we're going to do the whole thing again, but instead of being done after USDGC, we have to wait a couple more weeks to before I can go back to my family, before I can have the offs, and I have to do another event. And, oh, by the way, it's not just an event. It's a major. That's not going to be great for them. And then, again, like – We've talked about it already. This season makes no sense. And the, the Pro Tour has reached out to the players and has talked to us about potentially changing things up, changing up how we do the, the tour schedule. And I love that. So maybe the tour schedule gets super adjusted, and so this doesn't really matter. But like as of right now, if everything stands the way in, for next year, the back half of the season is so crammed packed with so many important events. It is I don't I don't think it's good. I, I don't think it's good at all. You're going to now have the world champion. The world champion is going to be announced. And then you're going to have two major winners now after the world champion and a tour champion uh announced after the world champion. No one's gonna care about the world champion. Like that, that you know what I'm saying? Like to me, it just it makes no sense. I would love to go in the off season where the world championship is like the last event. That to me makes the most sense. That's what everyone's pushing in the off season talking about. But now we're we've moved another major event later in the season. And now also we're not even talking about the fact of now we're ending our season in November and then the beginning of the season starts in early February. We've now sh- have shrunken the yep. the off season drastically. So yeah. I don't this is one where it's like I'm not too pressed because i don't believe the pga and i think they're going to quickly be like this is not a good idea psych uh we're changing it up they've done it before they'll do it again okay hunter i'd like to first say this entire episode is now on protest as that was my turn um and i just lost many potential points by second no yeah so i had a lot of entire episode here uh asterisk next to it why would that be your turn we because I went last in the people. previous episode. I went last in the previous answer. So I go first on the next answer. But We went uh, in the order of Brody, Hunter, Dustin. So it just goes back to the top of the order because we only had three people I, and four questions. All I know, Dustin, is that <laughs> I went third the last question. I we go started, first the next we started, question. We went Brody, Hunter, Dustin. Then we went then Hunter, we Dustin, back Hunter Brody. Dustin, Brody. Then we went Dustin, Brody, Hunter. I went last. I go first next. I have to. I think we just rotate who goes first. Yeah, like, it, it rotates who goes first. I don't think you're right. I'm, this episode's under protest. This episode's <laughs> under protest. You can't, I can't go last. Today. I just lost all my points. It was Brody's turn to go I first. I lost all my points. This episode's completely under protest. <laughs> Again, this is one of those situations where we have like four questions, but only three players, and so yeah, like, it gets a little wonky was, on the last one. Like, yeah. I went last. I'm now at a disadvantage again. <laughs> Huge disadvantage, back to back disadvantages. And side note, I got a point removed because I zoned out once. So hey, that's on you. I'm just saying. That's on you. I can wait, only no, 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 control hold on. what Everyone I can be, control. Be quiet. Hunter, and now Hunter, Dustin's interrupting Hunter. me in my point. No, no, no. Uh, this is my minute. This is my no, no, no. minute. No, you're okay. His this minute, is my minute. His minute hasn't started yet, so we're gonna let him. We're gonna. I'm not, I don't want to take that away from him. It's ludicrous. But I'm actually the one that gets screwed the most out of this situation, Hunter, because you're going second right now. That means I will have gone last on two of the questions. So I actually got screwed more than you did. So you're in the right order. No. So <laughs> you, you're, you're so in the right I'm order. Have to go last twice out of four questions, and that's fair. It was my turn to go first. Well, okay. I don't care. I don't want to hear it. Let me talk about the Beatles. I got the worst thing the You need to calm down. Let me talk about the Beatles here now that also, all my points. Also, why am I losing points? I was agreeing with Trevor. I was I was like literally this defending a, the sanctity this isn't of the show. This is about agreeing with the host here. This is about logic and fairness, and I got screwed. Beatles suck. Let's start there. Um, first off, I'm going to kill every Beatle I ever see from here on out. I'm not going to listen to Beatles music out of protest. Anything Beatle-related, gonzo. Um, Beatles better beware if you see my foot coming. Secondly, <laughs> PDGA. Uh, I am fully agreeing with Brody, which is why I'm pissed here. It's because these were my points to make. He and Brody's going to have to mad. agree with me. Uh, the PDGA is 100%. This is, I'm treating this as a fake announcement. I'm treating this as like <laughs> they were supposed to be texting the player union to get feedback, and they accidentally tweeted it. That's what I think is happening here. Because the pushback, like, it, it's not like we shrunk the season. We, we didn't gain that time you lose in April. Like, the season's still going to start yep. at Vegas. We're still going to tour. And now they just moved an event that should be in April to the end of the season. So they've elongated the season. Players are burnt out. 
fans are burnt out, and they moved it to when all of the heavy hitters are happening. You're going to come down to this final stretch. You have D-Glow, Ledgestone, you have Worlds, D- GMC, MVP, USDGC. The, A lot realistically, of acronyms. Realistically, let's be honest here. The disc golf season next year won't matter till mid-July. Mm. It's also going to be cold. On, Powerful. You're Mid-July on. Weather. And it's going to be cold. It won't be cold in Georgia down then. <laughs> Mid-July on, you're going to have every big event, the playoffs, like three of the four majors. And the major that's left that's not is a major that's not the most well attended. All the U.S. majors are happening yeah. in a span of two and a half months because Worlds has already been announced as like late August. So you have late August, early October, end of October, and the Tour Championship in the middle. We have two and a half months for the three Don't majors that the are playoffs. actually attended. Your favorite. And the playoffs. And some silver squeezed in there, too. I'm sure they'll find a way. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, it th- but I agree with Brody, though. The PDGA speaks, and then they try to look like the good guy of, look, we listened to feedback. We're going to move it. Look That's how nice. That's an interesting strategy, though. Um, you remember when they had that Worlds announcement of, like, times. this is the highest purse ever for Worlds? And then all of a sudden, like magically, more money they just raised, somehow yeah. got, yeah, yeah. There's but, there's, uh, a, there's a lot of. I think it's a bad. Marks. I think it's a bad decision. I think they're going to realize it's a bad decision, and they're just going to move courses as they should. Keep it in April because the April, April, June, August, October. That's a beautiful, perfect spacing for majors. That's how it should be. Mm. There you go, Dustin. What are your thoughts, Beatles? Beatles, not a fan. Um, the band's okay, but the Beatles that are eating trees, not a fan. Uh, mm. and, and so with that said, obviously, there's not much that the International Disc Golf Center can do about the situation. It's affecting a ton of the property. The pond's got to be clear. It's out of their control. It makes perfect sense that they would need to take their time after that's all handled to be able to sit back and create championship-level courses for the long term. And so I don't really fault the property, WR Jackson, the IDGC crew. Like, they're doing what they can, right? Now, with this whole situation about Champions Cup itself, I don't know if there's some type of legal thing there where like they own the rights to that major and so therefore like they have to keep it and the only time they can run it is after they get these courses redesigned so therefore it has to be that way for some type of like contractual reason if that's not the case though then i do think that the rescheduling of this major at the end of the year is not good like everyone's already said you already have worlds usdgc slash throw pink us women's you had the pro tour finale you have all this stuff taking place in the fall and winter time we need to maintain a springtime major as opposed to having this crazy long jam at the log jam at the end of the year and the reason why i say it is because is, is the way the flow works right now is that you have the season start you get to build up some storylines you go into your first major you have your first major winner you, you continue to build some storylines throughout the, the rest of the season you get to the summer you got the european open major and you have like this nice spacing of like a major every quarter so to speak where it's just like a nice even balance and so here Here's my proposal. If you, if indeed you guys are right, and that this post is fake, and that they're just waiting to see the temperature. Oh, okay. So they don't here's know my, it's fake yet. So, so here's my proposal. <laughs> here's my proposal. Let the new IDGC courses that are apparently not going to be ready until late October, early November, serve as the Pro Tour finale for the end of 2024. So that way, the IDGC property, while they won't get Champions Cup, they won't get a major that year, they will still get a big event that they can host on that property at the end of the year that's you know has some weight to it and is important. With that said, then you will need to have another property serve as the host of Champions Cup for just this one year. I'm not trying to screw over the IDGC over Champions Cup forever. Just This is a very special situation. So give them the Pro Tour finale, and then, oh, we're already in that little area. If, if we keep the tour kind of the same, Champions Cup goes to North Carolina. We keep the spirit of a wooded golf major, we find the best property that you want out in Charlotte or something like that, North Carolina, and have the Champions Cup still in the spring, which had a different location. Then 2025 rolls around. <laughs> you return Champions Cup to the IDGC. Keep that springtime major rolling. That's what I think should happen. Dustin's got it figured out. What if they switch? <laughs> the Champions Cup Nevin. goes to Nevins and then Tour Championship. Uh, before flip-flop. I cut off this episode, I would just like to point out whichever one of you two wins, just know this is back-to-back weeks I've been frauded out of a win. And also, I got from down to zero and back up to six, which is where I started. I couldn't even earn points. So that's fine. Good, y'all like have fun with six. a fake win. Uh, uh, no. Fake win. Whoever wins, fake win. Hot take: like Only six. good be- beetle, dung beetle. Yeah, it's probably fair. Probably I think it's the only good beetle. You know what? I are roly polies beetles? Because I like roly polies. Hmm. I don't think those. I'll are give you a point each for beetle suggestions. Is a cockroach a beetle? Uh, except Hunter. No. Um, that's fine. That's fine. All right, let's hey, move into hey, a rapid fire round. Hunter, I'm just scoot out of frame, if you will. No, I'm going to keep my mic on. <laughs> <laughs> 
Just slide out. <laughs> um, listen, for rapid fire round this time, I want actual rapid fire. I'm yeah, timing so. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you go above 30 seconds, I'm just going to start taking a point for every second you go above. So how's them apples? Well, I don't well, even know. 30 seconds, and that's a new rule for rapid fire. I thought I was still a minute. I'm going to give you 45 seconds. All right. I like 30. Let's run it. 45. All right, cool. For you, it'll probably take you 15 to get revved up. Mm. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, I'll give, uh, for question the rules, Dustin, do you want to go first or second? I'll go first. Okay. First topic. Does the U.S. Women's Championships, which is approaching this weekend, need to merge into USDGC or just continue working on improving the standalone event? It's kind of still trying to find its identity. Dustin, what do you think? Yes, they should merge. All the other majors are merged. So I don't think that USDGC and US Women should be any different. They should be one event. USDGC has a proven track record with its prestige, the course it uses. You also have Throw Pink that's now alongside of it, which works great. It's basically viewed as a major by the majority of the community. Another factor is what's best for viewership and what's best for fans. We know that FPO viewership benefits from being partnered with the MPO side across all the rest of the tour. It's no different for majors. We also know it's going to add to the fan experience on the grounds to be able to have all the players in one location playing a major together that you get to experience it's a no-brainer merge it let's have USCGC be a major for both divisions no-brainer a major in our hearts as we always say uh brody what do you think separation is key uh oh. if the fpo wants to continue to grow and they want to end up having fields the same size as the mpo you're not going to be able to run quality events with 240 250 300 players on one course so moving forward i think what is happening right now where there's separate events or even separate courses i think that is going to be what the norm is because again if you're trying to grow and you're trying to get more fpo players on tour at a certain point it's going to get capped because you can only have so many people play um on you know one course on one day Interesting. So you think they should just bite the bullet and and keep the keep sending it, keep sending it. Okay. Interesting. Not sure. Not sure if I agree for now, but I I see the point. I see the point. Um. All right. So one of the I think this kind of question is sparked by the idea of maybe moving Champions Cup, uh, because of that situation, and it, and it kind of brought up, you know, USDGC. I think a lot of people know that it it probably won't be at Winthrop University forever, right? It's on a college campus, not a lot of control there. There's been whispers about it moving. So if USDGC were to move from Winthrop next year, what would be the most important thing to execute to minimize loss of prestige and setbacks in fan attention? What's the most important thing to execute if they were to move next year? Brody. Gosh, I think it's got to be just the... Uh, like it's going to sound silly, but like the, the parking, the shuttles, like all the kind of things that are built in with having it on a college campus that you already have all the, all that stuff. I think that matters a great deal to when you come into the event before you even step foot on the course, it feels like this is a legit thing. You're not just parking in some random field and like walking a bunch uh, to, I, I don't know. I think that, to me, like pulling in, even though it is on a college campus, there is something to pulling into um, that course for the first time every year. It feels like something. So, um, now that is a, that is a fair point. I, I the logistics that's actually very good. I don't think a lot of people would pick that up, but I agree. The the logistics and like the the setting of parking and it, it does help. Uh, Dustin, what do you think? Uh, so I, I think Brody's right, but I think that you can achieve that same thing at a different property as long as you orchestrate it correctly. So uh, logistics are important, but that can be moved and transferred and done properly somewhere else. And so for me, I think the thing that's most important is that you're already going to have the USCGC title. So it's going to maintain the prestige because of the name and the trophy that it presents and the title that it means to people of being a U.S. champion. But I think that the thing that you have to maintain is a great course with tons of challenge and scoring separation. USDGC is often seen as one of the hardest majors to win due to the challenges that you face on the court. And so I think if you're going to move from a different property of Winthrop and all the challenges that it presents its players, you need to make sure that 
you are taking another property and, and, and having a course that provides a, a similar level of, of challenge where it's going to be diverse skill shots and things that need to take place throughout the course. Yeah, we know the broadcast is important. We know the fan experience is important. We know the logistics are important. But you can achieve that as long as you're near a big city and that you have the right property. So make sure that you nail the course and the property. I hate to say it, Dustin, but you just lost most of your points. <laughs> <laughs> you went you went like eight seconds over dude i, I said i said i was gonna take a point for each second i had to do it it took him for me too so it was fair i did I, t I started taking him for brody as well and i will give you back the points for your for your point but i had to stick to my guns i did it to brody i had to do it to you too <laughs> it just it's the name of the game i'm serious about this rapid fire thing um it used to be right. for the entire show's history but okay <laughs> but it wasn't when I just said 45 seconds. We agreed to we it. We agreed to it. A point That's... a second is ridiculous, but all right. <laughs> the you same move never to everybody. That, you've never held that standard to anyone before. You got to start somewhere. Now. You got to put your foot down. I got to put my I put my foot down. It's just right. it, it'll go down in history. The foot heard so around ridiculous. the world. <laughs> um, okay, final question. I don't want to hand this guy wins. <laughs> I don't want to do it. Even though you made up a brand new arbitrary rule on the spot right before that rule, back to back weeks. Back right. to back weeks. <laughs> that rule. <laughs> back to back. Let weeks. me be clear, Dustin. That rule should have hurt him more than anybody. <laughs> you know that's true. <laughs> I think. He, he I think. I think Brody and I both talk over time for sure, hundred mm. percent. There, everybody does. Uh, um. All right. And we're probably the fault. two worst that's defenders. Why I agree. My, that's why I'm putting my foot down. Um, all right. I also question. want you to know that I consciously tried to speed that up. So it's not like I was trying to be a douche about I, it. But no, I believe in you. I'm, yeah. I'm not mad at you, Dustin. Just disappointed. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> all right. We were, we were kind I mean, of already lost. The... But... No, no. Brody's not going to take a knee here. He's going <laughs> to flesh out his argument. Um, final topic. We were kind of talking about the spacing of the majors. And I think it's a good time to just bring up. Do we like the current spacing of the major tournaments and when they happen during the year? If not, how would you change it or improve it? You could move majors around, change what months they come in. Uh, did we have a good system before they just put one at Halloween? You know, so on and so forth. Dustin, what do you think? I like the current spacing. I think that it's nice to have a couple of months to get the season started before we have our first major in the spring. It allows you to see the competition, build some storylines, let the players work their rust off. Then you get back to the season, you build some more storylines, you have your next major in the summer, then you have Worlds near the fall, and then you know you have your major at the end of the year as well. Um, so, yeah, I really think that we need to just kind of keep the spacing that we've got, which is why we need to make sure that we bring Champions Cup back to the spring, and we need to merge USDGC and just have one major instead of having U.S. Women's off shoot on zone. I'm, I mean, I thought, yeah, I, th I thought that the spacing we had was really good until they just ruined it. Brody, do you agree? Yeah, I think the spacing is not terrible. The only thing I would say is I would like to see Champions Cup first, then European Open second, then USDGC third, and then Worlds fourth. Mm. So however you want to space that month-wise, but I think those, I, I would love to see that in order uh, that way. Kind of took a knee there. That was a, that was a pretty quick answer. Slightly, That's all I have to say about slight, it. Slightly took a knee. That's all I have I, to Justin, say. Justin, I will give you I two say, extra bonus points. I wouldn't say a, I wouldn't say he today. took a knee there. I think he gave a fair answer. So. I'll give you an extra point for sportsmanship too. <laughs> made it really made it really close. Um, Brody wins. Nobody's happy about it. Um, except maybe Brody. Except maybe I don't know. I, I'm I'm honestly gutted right now. Dustin no, you're came, not. In, yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am gutted. You came in costume today. You had a great performance. Um, eight seconds, man. It'll people are gonna be talking about that. Well, I mean, is the that, thing, here's the thing. To be fair, what Dustin did today was out of respect to Matty O. He just couldn't win. Dang, but he did. Yeah, Dustin's like the sixth time, man. What are you talking? I know, about? but I'm saying well, like he's he, got world 100 percent finals appearance rate. By the way, just want to throw that out there. Is that a real stat? It's a real stat. Go look at the vibes. <laughs> you can get that at debatenightstatmando.com. <laughs> um, oh man! All right, all right. All jokes aside, hopefully you enjoyed this episode of Debate Night. A little bit chaotic, but you know, sometimes we like to have a little fun on this show. Just sometimes. Um, yeah, make sure we be back next week. I think Brody will be in the studio again. Yeah, I'll be back. Double. I'll, I'll have to size. So you have to set up like a standing spot for Yeah, me. we're going to have to get apparently a standing spot. Apparently, you don't spot. need it. Although, man. apparently, it doesn't no, need it. I'm you telling you right now, my body needs it. This desk, I don't know how you guys sit behind this thing. I've got, it's not great. I got like no leg room. I've got chronic I'm, back issues. This is not great. Yeah. Um, I, need I think stand. I found this chair I'm sitting in at, next to a dumpster. Anyways, we'll see you next week on a bait night. Hopefully, you enjoyed.